not being rude, I promise. Do you want it? There's room here. Do you want me to swing around? Yeah, there. then you yeah, don't yeah. have to. Did you mean to put those stickers on your back? <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Communitech Data Hub. My name is Vladimir, and I'm part of the uh, um, Communitech team. Um, before we begin today, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this event. This Data Hub session is made possible thanks to the Next Generation Network Program, which is offered through a partnership between uh, the Center of Excellence in Next Generation Networks, so CENGEN, and the Ontario Centers of Excellence, uh, OCE, on behalf of the uh, Government of Ontario. As we're getting all settled here, um, Lisa Klimster, who's a business engineering manager at Sengen, will be sharing a bit more on how companies can leverage Sengen uh, uh, to their tech solution. I'd like to remind everyone that there is uh, an empty table um, right at the front if you would like to, um, to uh, come over there as we're getting set up. And everyone, please uh, welcome Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, as Vladimir is pulling that up, uh, my presentation, I'll just say a quick hello and thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm just gonna speak for about four to five minutes uh, about the Next Generation Network Program to ensure that you're familiar with uh, what the offering is and then I'll hand it back over to Vladimir to introduce the keynote speaker. So what is Sengen? We're the Center of Excellence in Next Generation Networks. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization, thank you that's been around for uh, about five years now. And I love my job. I love helping SMEs. Uh, our program is free and helps them overcome commercialization barriers. So if you'll bear with me while I explain the capabilities, um, I'd love to take you through what we can offer to you. Maybe. That's okay. So the reason why the government funds us, both federally and provincially, is really help to uh, make Canada more competitive on a global stage, thank you, with respect to the ICT industry. Um, so we've kicked off this partnership with, specifically with the Ontario government and OCE in 2018. Uh, OCE offers up to a $50,000 matching grant to offset your internal costs associated with doing a project on our infrastructure and I'll take you through what the program looks like. Maybe. <laughs> Manually, here we go. Okay, so there are two streams that we try and help uh, make Canada more globally competitive through the ICT market. And that's through working with SMEs, so companies under uh, $50 million in revenue, under 500 employees, uh, commercialized faster by leveraging our free infrastructure as well as engineering and marketing support. The other stream is through training professionals and students with our SendGen Academy with respect to next generation network technologies like Linux, Docker, and Kubernetes, uh, thus resulting in highly qualified professionals that are then capable of entering the ICT market in Canada. So the type of testing that our SMEs can do on our infrastructure are as follows, uh, benchmarking, system functionality and interoperability, scale, load, stress testing, machine learning, AI, and demonstration. I want to hone in on two of these as they're the most popular right now. About 80% of our projects are scale and load testing projects, whereby an SME will stand up a development instance of their application, either on one of Sengen's bare metal servers or in Sengen's cloud. Uh, and then we'll spin up a number of virtual machines in our cloud tenancy to simulate the volume that they're hoping to test to. And using traffic generators, we'll slam their application uh, with this volume to see where constraints lay, as well as what type of resources are required in terms of compute power at those volumes. I do want to mention machine learning as well, as we've recently acquired several NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs, which are very good at multi-threaded machine learning, as well as uh, NVIDIA T4s, which are very good for the inferencing piece of machine learning. So if you have an interest in any of those projects, please feel free to speak to me. 
and uh, be happy to work with you. In terms of our infrastructure, uh, it's comprised of a commercial grade cloud tenancy. So we don't actually use the cloud for any commercial purposes. Uh, the period that you're on our infrastructure to actually conduct the testing is a four to six week period, and then all of your data is removed from our cloud. Um, also, hardware hosting. If you have a connected hardware device and you're looking to test the functionality of the device, we can physically connect it to our infrastructure to test the functionality. If you're looking at testing uh, carrier grade fault tolerance, we have that capability. And bare metal servers. Uh, often these are used in conjunction with our cloud tenancy. Our SMEs will load their application actually on our bare metal servers. Uh, we have massive amounts of compute power at your disposal. Uh, one of our SMEs actually used 17 bare metal servers during the course of a project with us. Um, and want to do a shout out to our local company, 11X, who partners with us for LoRaWAN. They provide LoRaWAN to our IoT uh, customers who are wanting to test some actual live IoT data in conjunction with some simulated data for scale testing purposes and functionality purposes. So, uh, all of that is free. All of that access or infrastructure is free. Ultimately, it is you and your team that conduct, conducts the testing on our infrastructure, uh, but we provide support along the way. So we work on the project charter and create a test plan and provision the infrastructure uh, based on your customized needs. Uh, and during the execution of the project, if you run into any trouble at all, uh, we help troubleshoot that with you. Uh, and upon conclusion of the project, uh, our marketing team actually authors a white paper as an unbiased third party uh, that you can then take to potential investors or customers to validate your solution. And I just want to mention, of course, our relationship with Communitech is very important to us. Uh, we actually have one of our four data centers here in the basement, as we do in our other innovation hubs, Invest Ottawa and Mars in Toronto, and where we're headquartered in Canada. You'll notice that our members are multinational telco, companies that typically are very competitive, but within Sengen, they come together to collaborate to help advance the ICT sector in Canada. Uh, we've done over 89 projects to date, uh, and we certainly would love to work with you and do one as well. I will be sticking around for about an hour after this presentation and would love to speak with you. If you don't have an opportunity to connect with me, please do feel free to reach out to Vladimir, and I'm sure he'd be happy to connect. Uh, also, if you're interested in any of the training that we offer, Linux, Docker, Kubernetes, please also feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to work on that with you. Thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand this back over to Vladimir. Thank you very much, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Kusha. I work with Vlad. Uh, we'd just like to say a few words before we get started. As you all know, today we have MessagePoint presenting their incredible success in artificial intelligence R&D. And this phenomenal team has come together from the surrounding community, and this is a massive collaborative effort that is now being commercialized in a product expanding the boundaries of content intelligence. Um, working with Communitech, OCE, the University of Western Ontario, Sengen, and many other stakeholders that are here today, this is an excellent example of multi-stakeholder collaboration, bringing new technology to market. With that said, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Chenna Dixit and Matab Ahmed. Chenna is an AI ML research scientist at MessagePoint, and she is an integral part of the Marcy team. With her research and development activities sharply focused on the application of deep learning based techniques for natural language and image processing. Matab is a doctoral candidate at the University of Western Ontario, where he's doing his PhD research in an area of computational linguistics. Matab has also been working closely with the Marcy team at MessagePoint. Everyone, please welcome the MessagePoint team. Hi everyone, my name is Shahana and today I'm going to talk about uh, semantic textual similarity. Uh, so first let me start with uh, what we are or who we are, MessagePoint. Um, so MessagePoint is a customer communications uh, management platform that lets you deliver personalized communications through content intelligence. 
in message point uh, we have uh, a platform which which we call it mercy uh, that utilizes various co various content strategies and customer data to perform some insightful tasks uh, like content creation utilization and control uh, some examples of these tasks can be uh, semantic search or assisted authoring or uh, content compliance and uh, many others so Marcy uh, mainly deals with text content, which can be viewed as a multi-dimensional entity. And the dimensions uh, can be syntactic, semantic, or visual. And today, we are going to focus on the semantic dimension of the text content. So in order to explore uh, the content along the semantic dimension, we utilize similarity as a measure uh, for the content uh, relatedness. Um, and uh, so, so basically, uh, semantic similarity will act as a building block for these content intelligence uh, use cases. But uh, what is semantic similarity? So given two documents or content pieces, uh, uh, semantic similarity will measure uh, or determine how these two doc documents, uh, up to what extent these documents are similar in terms of meaning. And when you're talking about the multilingual scenario, these documents can be in different languages. And basically, the similarity has to be intolerant to the represent representational variations. And uh, for the multilingual scenario, these uh, variations can be across different languages. So uh, here's what we are trying to achieve. We want to compute semantic similarity across multiple languages. Uh, we handle this problem as a binary classification task where we want to provide bilingual sentence pairs as input and predict uh, whether these pairs are semantically similar or not. And we also want to learn the model which is scalable uh, with the input data across various languages and uh, domains. Uh, but there are a few challenges to these tasks. Uh, the availability of a multilingual corpus um, in terms of a business enterprise domain uh, is required for our task, which is difficult, uh, uh, difficult to get. And there are some other challenges which are specific um, uh, in terms of the multilingual context where uh, the computational representation of the words becomes difficult. And I think like any other problems, uh, language-specific pre-processing and data cleaning is also required for these kind of tasks, which is, again, a difficult uh, problem. So we try to handle these challenges uh, in order to fulfill our uh, research objectives. Uh, we actually provide a semi-supervised approach to collect the multilingual corpus, and we use this corpus to learn a model that is scalable and generalizable across various languages and uh, input documents. So now let me dive into the multilingual uh, corpus creation. How do we do that? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for our task, we require bilingual sentence pairs with labels that are semantically similar or dissimilar. And for simplicity, we label them as a positive pair and a negative pair. So what, what, what is a positive pair? Here uh, you can see uh, two sentences, S1 and S2, in different languages. They are actually meaning the same despite the syntactic variation, and that we call a positive pair. And in the, for a negative pair, you can see uh, two sentences, S3 and S4. They have some overlap um, between the words, though in different languages, uh, but they actually mean different. And that's what we mean by a negative pair. So um, this, this uh, let, let's go to how do we create a positive, um, a positive, a pool of positive samples. It actually uh, begins where you want to gather data from the web. Uh, you want to parse that data to extract, uh, extract text from it. 
And then uh, you do some additional work on that data uh, to ensure that the content that you have is, is aligned. So let's talk more about how do we actually do it. Now, we are looking to create bilingual content that is mostly human written and not translations, so that we can uh, generate a model which is close to the uh, business, uh, business language model for our communication. And that's why we target bilingual or multilingual websites um, and gather data um, in terms of web pages which are parallel or basically which has uh, content which, which says the same, uh, same thing but in different language. Now, uh, once you have these parallel uh, web pages, you want to be able uh, to extract, uh, you want to be able to extract some text content out of these uh, web, web pages. So uh, once, once you have these web pages, you basically extract raw content uh, for these parallel files. Uh, and at the end of this particular process, you will have parallel text files uh, in, different, in, the, in different languages, but the content inside these files may not still be parallel or may not still be aligned. So, so basically, in order to align, these, uh, align the content in the text files, what we do is we perform translation of a non-English uh, language files, which here I've, I have an example of a French. So we translate the French files uh, into English and we align the files based on a distance uh, measure that we use. So now the files that you are gonna have are basically parallel text files and the content inside these files are, you can ensure that these are aligned and now these uh, these aligned content actually becomes your uh, positive pairs for your corpus. So once you have the entire workflow, this is what your file is gonna look like. Uh, these, these files, they come from the parallel, uh, these lines, they come from the parallel text files that you have. Um, and then as I think you can see, you have the English line, you have the French, or you can have any other language, and then you have the positive pair. Now, uh, once you have the positive pairs, you want to get the negative uh, samples. So in order to get ne uh, true negative samples, a plain or random sampling is not enough because you want content which, mean, which has a different semantic meaning or a semantic representation um, and which is expressed using maybe the same words or different words. So we intelligently select negative samples using a topic uh, modeling algorithm so that we can pool from, uh, uh, we can pool the pairs from the same uh, topic. Here uh, for the topic modeling, we choose LDA and uh, we apply this on the aligned English text files. So uh, we know that for any clustering algorithm, um, one hyperparameter that needs to be tuned is the number of topics. For that, we basically uh, train um, a range or uh, a bunch of uh, unsupervised LDA models, and we, we select the best LDA model based on, uh, uh, we basically measure the effect based on uh, the coherence score uh, versus the number of topics. So the best LDA model is the one that has the maximum coherence score. Once you have the best LDA model, you want to get document vectors for each document in the set of your text files. And these document vectors are the probability distribution of a document over all the topics um, that you have. And after uh, getting the document vectors, uh, you basically take the argmax on them to get the dominant topic of each of the documents. And once you have these dominant topics, you can group or basically you can cluster your documents based on uh, the, the dominant topic. So you will have k different clusters for let's say k different uh, dominant topics. 
once you have these clusters of documents, now you, you want to be able to generate the negative samples. So what you do is you can grab one, uh, one pool or one cluster of documents. And for example, you can randomly sample two sentences from this particular pool. Uh, I have an example which, is, which you can call ENX and ENY. Uh, and these sentences can come from either the same document or even different, but it's important to remember that the topic or the cluster remains the same. Once you have these sentences, uh, we basically get the sentence representations uh, of these sentences and we use open, uh, pre-trained OpenAI GPT model uh, to get these representations. The reason to use this sentence representation is because it encodes semantic information um, across your sentences. And then we basically apply um, a threshold-based uh, cosine similarity measure to, to get, uh, to, to know basically that the ENX and ENY are negative samples or not. So far you have got negative samples but they are in English language you want to get the bilingual uh, negative pair. So here comes mm, the French uh, aligned files into picture, and you can get the corresponding parallel French sentence from the English one that you have, and that can give you the bilingual negative sentence pairs. So you can repeat this process for uh, as many negative samples that you require for your corpus. And you can, all, you should, I would say, you should use all the different topics to perform these steps so that you can cover all different topics in, uh, in the corpus that you want to generate. Now, once you have this entire workflow, you can get the negative samples which are going to look something like this. And now you can see that we have our multilingual corpus that we can go and apply to, our, uh, uh, to, the, to the model that we want to use. So we actually crawled five different bilingual websites, and uh, this particular uh, corpus that we generated out of these websites has sentences with a minimum of four and maximum of 200 words. And uh, we create three different data sets from the entire corpus that we collect, which is, based, which is divided uh, based on the domains and uh, the language pairs, which is English, French, and English, uh, Spanish. So we actually do plan to open source this data set. We haven't yet, but we are planning to do that. Um, so for, for anyone to use, if you're interested. And now I think uh, I'd like to invite Matab, who's gonna talk about the model details and the results that we have. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Matab, so I'm going to continue from here. Uh, okay, so first we are going to see how the model architecture looks like, that the, that the model we are going to, we use to, we use to uh, measure the semantic similarity between two sentences. So we start with two sentences, uh, sentence one, sentence uh, one S1 and sentence two S2. So these two sentences are in two different languages. Say we are talking about English and French. So once we have these two sentences, uh, we pass these two sentences to an encoder block. So we can see two encoder blocks here, but the, but the two, but actually there was one encoder blocks, the weights were actually shared. So the job of this encoder block is to uh, represent the sentences in terms of vectors. Like you give a set of words and you give this to the encoder block uh, and it generates a, a series of numbers for each sentence. So we, we term the, the, the number that represents sentence S1 as U and sentence S2 as V. So we get two numbers now, U and V. So now we pass these two uh, numbers, this U and V, to a matching operation layer where a bunch of matching operations are performed on these two U and Vs and the final decision is going to be taken by a classifier on top, which is a straight uh, neural network bit, uh, based classifier where you uh, pass the output of the matching operations and it classifies whether the two sentences at the bottom, that means S1 and S2 are similar or not. 
So how the encoder looks like. Uh, so this encoder comes, uh, so at the, at the beginning we can see, uh, we see there's a, there's a layer called Muse word embeddings. That means you give a sentence and you give each word of that sentence to this Muse embedding layer and it represents each word as a, as a vector. So say we are talking about a sentence with five words. So if you, if you give those five words to the Muse embedding layer, it's going to represent, it's going to give you five vectors. And then you have, an, then you have uh, the by LSTM layer. You can see uh, there's one LSTM which is going forward and one LSTM which is going backward. So you apply those uh, two LSTMs on top of the Muse word embeddings and uh, you get two numbers uh, for each word position. And then you concatenate these two numbers. So say uh, number position one gives you 300 dimensional vector for the forward direction and say 300 dimensional vector for the backward direction. Uh, when you concatenate those two, it becomes say 600 dimensional vector. So you get this four. So you you get these vectors over each word positions. Uh, but what we want at the end is just a summary for the sentence. So we apply a, a max pooling layer on top of it um, to get just one summary. So this gives you a a representation U for the sentence S1. So if you do the same thing for sentence S2, it's going to give you V. So after this step, you're going to get uh, U's and V's. So the next uh, thing in the picture is the matching operation. But before going there, uh, we saw that we had the Muse embedding at the, at the beginning. So what Muse does is uh, you have, uh, say, you, you represent a word uh, cat in English, and you represent the word, say, ghetto in, in Spanish or French. So it's going to, it's going to align those two, two words uh, into the same semantic space. That means uh, you want just one set of numbers for a word in two different languages. So, so Muse actually does the uh, magic here. That means you give two words in two different languages, it gives you just one representation of that word across the languages. So it makes the model uh, language agnostic. Um, so once you have these two U's and V's uh, that we saw before, you pass those two U's and V's uh, to this matching operation layer where you, where you have the bunch of matching operation is going on. So you can see the first operation that we did was uh, the concatenation of those two vectors. So we just concatenate U's and V's as it, as it is. And then you have the, uh, we saw the element wise product of those two vectors. Uh, and we also saw the absolute difference, element wise difference of those two uh, vectors. So technically we, we, uh, we had those three features and at the end we, we just concatenate those uh, three features and made a large vector of it. So, so the last thing, the u, v, u times v, and u minus v, uh, the absolute value is a larger vector uh, in terms of size. So this matching, this vector actually works as a, as a feature for the, for the classifier that is, that is waiting on top to classify those two sentences. Uh, so you, you, give this to, you give this feature to this, this classifier layer uh, which starts uh, which starts with one fully connected layer of size 150, and the following one is also 150 uh, dimensional layer, and the last one is the is a two dimensional layer because you're going to classify whether the two sentences are uh, same or not. So that's why the label is either zero or one. And so finally, the, finally after this 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 classifier layer, you're going to classify whether that uh, sentences that you're comparing that means the English and French or English Spanish whatever language you have are same or not. Uh, so the next thing is the results. Uh, so we trained a bunch of models. So you can see at the left, uh, the bold face one, English, French, we trained on the English, uh, French uh, government data set and we have around 195K training samples. Uh, the English, Spanish was, was trained on uh, English, Spanish insurance banking data set and English, French, Spanish, it's trained on the government and insurance banking data set for, for all the languages. And it has the larger training size, uh, training set size among all. Okay, so we did a bunch of experiments. So the first experiment we have here is the uh, cross validation one where you, uh, we train actually 10 models because we did the 10 fold cross validations. So uh, as you train 10 models, you have uh, 10 decisions of those 10 models but you want to summarize those decisions into just one decision. So we, we took the uh, ensemble approach. Uh, so the first ensemble approach was the mean accuracy. So we reported the mean accuracy uh, here in the, in the mean column and, and it also has the standard deviation across all the models. So you can see almost all the models are pretty consistent in terms of decisions. 
uh, in terms of the decisions and the standard deviations is, is, is quite low. And the max voting ones say if you have, say as we have 10 models, if the majority of the models are saying that, okay, these two sentences are positive, uh, then we are going to take that decision as the, as the final decision. Uh, so you see the numbers are uh, pretty close, but the, but the max voting one is uh, quite a little bit better than the mean accuracy one. Okay. So, so that result that we presented uh, in the last slide was on the, uh, on the validation data set. We, so we also had a held out uh, test, uh, test portion of the data set. And this result is on the test set of the data set. So you can see for the English and French, Spanish, English and French one, uh, the, the te on the test set we are getting around 95.64% accuracy. On English to Spanish one we are getting around 97.25%. Uh, and from the last one, as it covers both English, French, and English, Spanish, so that's why we are uh, we are we are we are doing the we are giving the reports on on both the uh, both English French and English uh, Spanish. So you can see the numbers are pretty consistent. Uh, yep. And so one interesting experiment we did was uh, the we we did was say we did the cross language performance that we wanted to see okay if we train the model on English French and if we test it on the English Spanish how it works. And also we we we. We wanted to see if we train the model on a on on the government data and test it on the insurance data, how it works. So we did the cross language as well as the cross domain performance checking. Uh, so this uh, this result shows okay. So the English and French one is on the government domain, and the language is English French. But we tested it. Uh, we tested the model on the English and Spanish, where the language is obviously English, English Spanish, and the domain is insurance banking. So you see the, the numbers are pretty good. It's even better than its own test set. So it's 95.91. Uh, when we test the English Spanish model, which is trained on English and Spanish language, and tested on the English and French language, and on the government domain, uh, then the domain is different, the language is different, we are getting 87.15. So there is a slight drop in the performance uh, because the English to Spanish one has less uh, the training set size is very small. You can see we had only 34,000 training samples to train the model on. Okay. And the final thing is we wanted to see, okay, so all the tests that we did was on the data set that we created by ourselves. But we wanted to see how we are doing on the public domain. So we, we, we choose one data set which is called, uh, which is a well-known uh, data, public data set and well expe except, uh, expected by, by the, accepted by the, academia as well as the industry, and this is called MSRP, which is Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus, uh, where the task is to do paraphrase identification. That means you have two sentences, and you see whether, that's, whether the sentences are paraphrases of each other or not. And the language is English and English. So there's one more um, uh, difficulty uh, level, right? So you can see uh, this data set comes with uh, its own training set and its own test set. So the models, uh, the, so the accuracy that we reported here from the second column, from the second row, we can see those models at the bottom are trained only on the training set um, of this data set. So you can see the numbers, it's 74.46, 73.96, 73.5, these, right? But our model, which is on top, uh, so we, it, it involves the transfer plus, plus the fine tuning. So what we did was we had a bunch of models. We took the best model. Uh, and then we further train that model on the training set of this data set. And then we test on the test set of this data set. So we are getting around 76.05, so which is say around 1.6% better than the, that the second best model. So this proves that the data set that we created uh, has some kind of semantic aspects, plus uh, it's multilingual. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I think John is going to continue from here, and she's going to conclude, yeah. So to conclude, uh, we created, uh, we basically gathered a multilingual corpus um, and we provide um, um, an approach to get the positive and negative sample pairs. Uh, using this corpus, we learned a language agnostic and scalable model uh, by utilizing multilingual word representations. And the learned model can be used to predict on data uh, which has different language or a different domain. 
and we also showed uh, that we the, the model, when fine-tuned uh, on the benchmark MSRP dataset, it achieves a state-of-the-art performance. As a part of future work, we plan to improvise our sentence-based semantic similarity model that we have. We want to try a bunch of other uh, encoders and network architectures, and also enhance the pre-processing steps that we have for, uh, for, for our data. We also want to look at the paragraph-based semantic similarity um, uh, task. And uh, I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, we also want to look at the visual dimension of the semantic similarity problem. So this uh, work that we presented, uh, we have uh, one paper, I would say. One is accepted, uh, if you want to go and look at it. And I think we have one submission that we are waiting for the results. So uh, that's it. Thank you. And if you guys have any questions, we are open to. All right, so we're just going to open up the floor for questions. All right, so I'm just going to pass uh, the catch box around. What? You talk into it. Sorry about that. Um, so you assign a word, a representation in your computation. What about the punctuation marks? About? Uh, sorry. Punctuation marks. I think uh, we have them, uh, we have removed them in the pre-processing part. But a punctuation mark changes the meaning of a sentence uh, tremendously. Yeah. Yes, so I think that's something that we want to handle in our um, enhanced pre-processing part. Because uh, for now, I guess um, we only consider the sentence length of four to 200 words only, right? So then we want to enhance that as well and then incorporate the uh, punctuations uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so for uh, when we were preparing our data set, you used the uh, OpenAI GPT model as your encoding method. But for the actual comparison task, you, and the reason you said was because it captures better semantic, sem similar, uh, semantic meaning of the sentence. But while for the main model, you decided to go for the uh, Muse word embeddings. Um, wouldn't it have been better if you uh, used the GPT model there itself? And that would have even to capture the semantics in there? Uh, so thanks for the question. So, um, so Muse, we, we picked because it gives you the uh, option to go multilingual, right? But the OpenAI GPT, it gives you just one representation over the sentence. So we took Muse for the word embeddings and OpenAI GPT for the sentence embeddings. So yeah, I mean, because for the, at the same time you were doing max pooling to actually get a sentence representation, right? When after doing the getting the Muse embeddings and then passing it to binary stream and then doing the max pooling, it's essentially trying to get a sentence representation of that. Sentence. Oh, so you're saying that uh, why not say OpenAI GPT right from the beginning? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, so. So the high level view we have right now is, the, is with the max pooling block, uh, but that max pooling block can be replaced by any kind of summarization layer, right? Attention or anything, right? So we wanted to visualize that how the model actually puts attention over the words. So that's why we go to the, um, the with the LSTM option rather than the transformer option. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, just a question, when you're doing the data set construction, um, did you like verify it at all with people who are bilingual in different languages, sort of a, sort of a pass over spot checking how the translations are? Um, because I guess the assumption there is that you know, the text is aligned at the same spots on websites, but perhaps actually it's semantically different. Uh, yeah, we actually manually did eyeball the data set uh, to check if they were uh, uh, actually aligned. And I think apart from um, the entire workflow that we have, there's a lot of minute pre-processing or post-processing that is done to ensure that they are aligned. Cool. Thank you. So you showed that, uh, at least with uh, French and Spanish, that uh, when you were training on like the French and showing that it translated into Spanish, that it was language agnostic. Would you be able to verify that with two languages that were perhaps more linguistically 
distant because uh, English and sorry, Spanish and French have very similar origins. So, is it like a true agnosticism in that sense? Um, so, uh, we have actually tested a bunch of samples, not on a particular data set that exists, but we have tested some samples on, uh, I believe, German and Italian as well, and they seem to work pretty well. Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Do we have any questions from the online? All right. Last call. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So Chana and Matab, uh, thank you very much for uh, offering your time and effort to present today at the Data Hub and sharing your insights on uh, SDS. Uh, we've put together a little something to show our appreciation there for you. And uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you to our online audience there as well. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.